Sucio Talk, Sucio Talk Live. Vivo. Fucking live. Sucio Talk Live. As you know, we are live every Monday at 10 p.m. You can call in right now from 10 to about 11, sometimes 12, depending on how I'm feeling, depending on how the conversation is going. Uh, Michelle the Fox, what's up? Surfer Joe 5000, what's up? B34NS, also known as Beans, what up? Andrew Lou, Lou Weller, what up? Uh, out here in Palm Springs doing it, doing the live no matter where I am, Mondays at 10. All right, so feel free to call in 510-463-1145. Um, good week, a lot of shit happened, man. Got the Grammys. Um, Grammys happened. That was cool. A lot of shit there. Um, Black History Month this month, which I am going to highlight one historic black chef. Um, and as you know, com for your merch, merchandise, show merch, merch helps me out. Helps me uh, maintain you know what I mean? So go get yourself a hoodie. Go get yourself a shirt, something, a coffee cup, a mug, you know, uh, help out Sucio Talk. You can go in the shop there on the, the Instagram uh, or SucioTalk.com, whatever you'd like. Also, YouTube. Uh, you can hear the calls more on YouTube, on Instagram. So sorry, you can't hear the calls. Uh, going to mitigate that, but for now, you're just going to have to deal with it. So, YouTube, if you want to hear the phone calls, don't have any callers as of yet, anchor.fm.com. Uh, I think it's just anchor.fm uh, to listen to it audio only. And then Spotify, of course. If you're on Spotify, go to the Sucio Talk page, leave a five star review, uh, hook me up. All right. And as of, and that's it. I hate doing that shit because every time I, I log on here, I got to be like, go on Spotify, go on Anchor, go on YouTube subscribe but that's what having a podcast entails nowadays so uh black history month chef austin leslie this guy is new orleans fried chicken royalty all right let's get it let's get it straight here chef austin leslie okay uh, i'm gonna go online here and, and see um pulled up a little bit of history on him so you can follow along with me here on YouTube. Uh, Austin Leslie, New Orleans. In a city with culinary history and a reputation completely disproportional to its size. Austin Leslie, 1934 to 2005, rest in peace, stood out as one of the iconic chefs of New Orleans in the late 20th century. Many claims that he made the best fried chicken in the city. You hear that? The best fried chicken in New Orleans? That shit is, that shit is hard to do. But my man did it. Chef Austin Leslie of New Orleans. Black History Month here. Uh, let's see. He was born in New Orleans. Lived almost all of his life there. He was born the son of Glenn and Ruby uh, Leslie. And grew up living at 704th North Miro. Whoever's out there in New Orleans knows what I'm talking about. Starting in middle school, he delivered fried chicken by bicycle for Porsche's Chicken Shack on South Rampart in the French Rampart in the French Quarter. Uh, delivering fried chicken on a fucking bicycle. Yeah, that's right, Nick Gambino. You do have a pic of Austin Leslie hanging in the bar at work, and that's what made me think of that because Trey showed me that picture and I thought it was dope that he had it on the wall over there when I did that podcast. You can check that podcast out on YouTube. Uh, the one I did uh, with the uh, St. Germain boys down in New Orleans. Um, that restaurant's pretty baller. I hope to eat there soon. The owner, Bill Turner, also taught young Austin about restaurants and especially about seasoning and frying chicken. Turner also owned Porsche's Fountain and Grill on Louisiana. In 1952, city directory, he listed as working at Portis Poultry. After a stint in the Army, which took him to Korea, Austin... Um, he returned to New Orleans and tried business school. In the 1954 city directory, he's listed as a student and then worked it in a, an assortment of jobs, including sheet metal, 
Then in 1959, he got a job as an assistant chef in a popular restaurant at the D.H. Holmes Department Store on Canal Street. Uh, this is New Orleans black history right here. Uh, the D.H. Holmes Department Store. In the, oh, this is a picture. You guys can't really see that. Uh, at home, at Holmes, Austin learned hot cuisine, preparing classic Creole dishes such as oyster Rockefeller and shrimp remoulade, just delicious. 1964, Austin's aunt Helen DeJean Pollock moved her Howard's Eatery restaurant to a new place in the Seventh Ward and rechristened it Shea Helene. Austin soon joined her there. He incorporated some dishes he learned at D.H. Holmes to go, along with Helen's standard fare, and created what some have called Creole Soul. I'm talking Austin Leslie here, New Orleans royalty chef. This guy was known to have the best fried chicken in New Orleans. That shit is hard to do. Uh, if you're following me on YouTube, you get to see some sick-ass pictures of this dude. Uh, unlike many soul food chefs who can be very secretive, Austin wasn't opposed to sharing his recipe. Ah! On the other hand, it appears that there are at least five different recipes floating around. James Cullen, chef at Treo, has made an entertaining video showing his attempt to recreate the recipe. Leah Chase characterized Austin's food this way. It was just good old Creole food, good old time New Orleans food, and he was good, damn good. You couldn't fry a chicken better than Austin. You couldn't stuff a pepper better than Austin Leslie. God damn, imagine people saying that about you. That's the fucking kind of legacy I want to leave behind. When Helen retired in 1975, Austin brought, bought Shea Helene and his reputation continued to grow. But even a fictional, uh, fictional TV show based on Shea Helene, see part two coming soon, couldn't save the little restaurant from the economic realities of trying to survive in the neighborhood uh, white folks might describe as sketchy neighborhood. In 1989, Austin went bankrupt. The restaurant closed for good in 1994 and burned shortly thereafter. God damn, there's a lot of fucking restaurant fires. The concrete base can still be seen on the corner of what was 1540 North Robertson. And there's a picture of it on this website. I'm on uh, foodtellsastory.wordpress.com over here. I'm trusting that this is a, a, a good source here. After that, Austin's career took a lot of twists and turns. He worked at several restaurants, including the Basin Street Club. He also signed on as a fry cook at Jack Leonardi's Jack Emo's. Uh, Jack became a disciple and has continued to make Austin's chicken. Damn. Along the way, Austin opened a restaurant in Copenhagen. Okay. He just opened a restaurant in fucking Copenhagen where New Orleans cuisine was popular. New Orleans cuisine popular in Copenhagen. What's up with that? Let's talk about that one. Let's talk about that, Renee. Why don't you? <laughs> if, if, he, if he reopens Noma as a New Orleans cuisine, I'm going to be fucking, you heard it here first. I'm fucking Susio talk. Uh, Austin was back home working at Pampy's in 2005 when Hurricane Katrina hit. Like thousands of others, when the levees broke, on August 29th, Austin was unable to leave his house and was trapped in his attic for two days. The humid heat was stifling, estimated between 98 to 120. He was rescued and taken to the convention center, became ill with a high fever, and was taken to the hospital in Atlanta, but died there on September 29th. Rest in peace. On October 9th, Austin was given the first post-Katrina Jazz funeral, which led a march through the streets and passed considerable rubble from Pampy's past the empty lot of Shea Helene and ending at the Back Street Cultural Museum in the Trem neighborhood. Many saw it as a sign of hope in the wake of disaster. There you go, Chef Austin Leslie. Chef Austin Leslie, badass. All right, that's your uh, black history here on Sucio Talk. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but Soleil Ho has stepped down from her position as the food critic for the SF Chronicle. Uh, crazy shit. This has got to be the first time in a long time that a food critic, after garnering such a crazy-ass position, has left in such a short amount of time. So, uh, what to think about this? I told you guys last week, man, these, this, these jobs where people stay for years, uh, this is not going to happen anymore. Okay. Things are going to, uh, be a quick, quicker turnaround nowadays. So, you know, the Michael Bowers of this world are, are going to go, you know, the Pete Wells of this world are going to go. Um, 
I don't think we're going to see another critic in our time uh, be so tenured, you know, because uh, we're so quick to leave. But I'm not, I'm not saying she's leaving before her time was up. Uh, I'm just saying it's a rather short tenure for a San Francisco Chronicle food critic. You know, that position is highly prized. It's only become available, you know, since Michael stepped down. Uh, so Leo Ho took it over. Um, uh, one of one of my chef friends hit me up and he was like, I'm happy that she stepped down, you know, uh, his opinion, not mine. But uh, let's see what happens and who they put in that position. It's going to be interesting. Um, fucking Grammys yesterday. What's up with the Grammys? Uh, Jay-Z's performance was dope. That table setting, that was cool. Um uh, Bay Destrian 30 says she prefers Cesar Hernandez. He does a better job of giving new spots some shine. You're right. And I will say in the past, I have gone to some Soleil host spots and they haven't been that good. Uh, again, just the opinion of one guy. The fuck do I know? Uh, um, so Grammys yesterday, she was crazy. You know, I noticed they kind of blew this uh, whole Ben Affleck thing out of proportion. He looked like he was on drugs. It looked like he took some mushrooms or some, maybe some pills and was trying to just like, you know, be normal. And then they're putting the fucking camera in his face and he's all over the news today. I, you know, at least they thought he was bored and not on fucking drugs. You know what I mean? So shout out to him. Uh, historic Bad Bunny performance. Fucking Bad Bunny came out with, uh, looked like paper mache heads, but he basically had caricatures of these historical... Uh, figures in Puerto Rican history. We got Teo Calderon, who's, um, to me, the godfather of Afro-Caribbean uh, reggaeton. Uh, Roberto Clemente, of course, baseball. Uh, Julia de Burgos, uh, poems of colonialism, uh, legacy of slavery, U.S. imperialism, that kind of thing. Uh, Ismael Maelo Rivera, a gran sonero. Uh, he made basically rhythms that we kind of disguise and we don't know today, but back in the day, uh, this has this thing called La Clave, right? And La Clave goes, <laughs> right? And that is the basis for a lot of the music in Puerto Rico. Uh, Tite Curet Alonso, uh, he's a composer, writer. Uh, his songs have reached the voices of Ruben Blades, Tito Rodriguez, Celia Cruz, uh, Cliff Feliciano, and Willy Colon. So, and Lola Rodriguez, he also had one, um, she, the Tio, she's a feminist movement leader. Uh, so, it was cool to see Bad Bunny on the world stage, bringing Puerto Rico out with him. Uh, I hope I can do the same in this podcast shit, you know what I mean? Um... Might pin some products over here. Tell me to pin, pin a product, man. Sucio tank top, Sucio bucket head. Ooh. There we go. There we go. All right. There we go. Uh, so bad bunny performance, fucking badass. Not as cool to watch award shows as it used to be. I remember people used to have parties up around that shit. And uh, people don't get down like that. So, you know, I remember before people used to have parties for the Grammys, parties for uh, the VMAs were a big one. We used to all talk about that shit the day after at school. And it seems to me like that shit is going away. So let's, uh, I hope that our awards, maybe Michelin, maybe James Beard, maybe, uh, maybe Susie Otago will start a, an award. Um, that is like that. You could have the red carpet for chefs. I mean, I know they kind of do that, James Beard and Michelin. Um, hoping to get a press pass so I can sneak in there and interview some chefs, you know what I mean? Uh, congrats to Cody Rhodes and Rhea Ripley for winning the 2023 Royal Rumble. I know you guys don't want to fucking hear that, but uh, professional wrestling, right? Everybody kind of is like, why the fuck do you like it? Suspension of disbelief. You know what I mean? Al Pacino wasn't really a Cuban cocaine dealer. You know? Are you mad at him? I don't think so. Um, I've been checking out the news. I got this thing called Breaking Points. Uh, Crystal 
uh, and Sagar uh, do a good job of, I didn't know this, I used to, I, I watch it uh, quite frequently, and then I figured out that both of them are from both sides. So, cool to see a news program that has both sides represented. Um, and uh, obviously some shit going on in the world. Got the war. Fucking shout out to, uh, or, you know, condolences to Turkey and Syria going through that uh, earthquake right now. You know, what can you say? Uh, you just, the show must go on. You know, unfortunately, I hope uh, that they get all the help that they need to get through this hard time. Fucking nuts. Uh, we were talking about today on Instagram about these fucking chickens, man. I went to Whole Foods today. There was no eggs. And when there is eggs, they're like $7 a carton. So this bird flu, um, the NPR article, somebody sent it to me. It came out December 2nd, so I'm a little late to the game here. I don't really watch uh, the news that much, but maybe, maybe NPR food news is something that I need to pay attention to. Uh, what we know about the deadliest U.S. bird flu outbreak in history. In history, son. Uh, U.S. is enduring an unprecedented poultry health disaster. Highly contagious bird flu virus triggering the deaths of some 52.7 million fucking chickens going down. The culprit is highly pathogenic avian influenza or HPAI. It has ravaged farm flocks and chicken yards in 46 states since February. God damn. When the first cases were reported in commercial flocks. It's the worst toll on the poultry industry since 2014-2015. See, I know this shit has happened before. That's why I was, like, tripping on it. I'm like, it's happened before and they haven't prepared for this? Um, we were talking about the egg industry and how uh, talking from somebody that knew about them selling the eggs to companies that freeze-dry them for dried egg products, right, that you reconstitute on all this shit. And I just served a dinner to a uh, an elderly woman from Scotland, and she was telling me that in the 50s there was a, um, there was no eggs available in Scotland, and they had to use this powdered egg product, which you basically reconstitute in the water uh, and used like that. But... You know, as we look around in today's world, there is more and more products being made, more and more companies being made, more startups, right? So, um, mayonnaise, right? More eggs are being used now. More of the products that you don't really think about. Like, to make aioli, you need oil, right? Um, more oil is being used. It makes me think of the car industry, right? They're making more cars, yet... They're not making any more roads. So I'm like, where do we stop making vehicles? Or do we start making more roads so we can, you know, uh, house the vehicles in which we build? I don't know how many new vehicles get made a year, but it's got to be a big number. And um, we certainly don't need it. There's a lot of lots in the middle of, of America here which just... Cars that never got bought, you know, new cars that never got bought. So hopefully they're recycling that material somehow. But imagine just the man hours and labor that went into that shit. Are you just going to fucking not sell cars? And then new cars keep coming out every year? Like, can we just take a break for a second? And just, like, realize where we're at? So make more cars every year, not making more roads. There's no more world to be got, you know what I mean? There's no more land to build fucking roads on and shit. So what is the plan? What is the end game here? All right. 50 million birds dead. Earlier outbreak also started in the winter, but while that ordeal was over by the following June, the current outbreak lasted through the summer and has surged anew. I'm hopeful that this is not the new normal for us. Director of World Health Organization's Collaborating Center for Studies on the Ecology of Influenza and Animals tells NPR. God damn, that's a lot. You imagine being like, hey, 
Hey, Richard Webby, what do you do? Oh, uh, I'm the director of the World Health Organization's Collaborating Center for Studies on the Ecology of Influenza and Animals. That's what I fucking do. You got to shorten that up, bro. Can't be living that life. Um, so birds have died from the disease itself, but the vast majority are being culled through flock depopulation. That means killed, 86th to try to stop the virus from spreading. That includes millions of chickens and turkeys in barns and backyards that have been raised to provide eggs or meat. That's why we had that turkey shortage back in the day, this last turkey day over here. Uh, here's what you need to know about the 2022 outbreak in the U.S. 52,695,450 million birds. Oh, my God. Wait, 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 wait. 52 million. Yeah, I'm reading that right have been wiped out. The losses stretch across the U.S. and their deepest in the country's middle. More than a million birds have been killed in each of the 11 states that stretch from Utah to the Midwest and onto Delaware, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Shit is crazy out here. In Iowa, two massive egg-laying operations had to call more than 5 million birds in single incidents earlier this year. Unlike the 2014-15 outbreak, this one is being driven by wild birds, not by farm-to-farm -farm transmission. For commercial and backyard flocks, many early infections centered along the intersection of the grant of the central and Mississippi flyaways of migratory wild birds. As those birds traveled, so did the virus. We don't know exactly what it is about, what it is about it, but it does seem just to be able to grow and transmit better in wild birds. Webby. This same guy, who is also a member of the Infectious Diseases Department at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. God damn. Once again, wild birds are the perfect mechanism to spread a virus because they, of course, fucking fly. Yeah, no shit. Okay. Isn't that what COVID came from? Fucking bats. Influenza viruses are common among wild aquatic birds, which often show no symptoms despite being infected. In January, the dangerous H5N1 flu virus was found in American Wigeon Duck in South Carolina. The damn ducks have H5N1. Crazy. The first U.S. case since 2016, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. More reports poured in over the following weeks and months, raising alarms as the virus spread to more states. A highly pathogenic avian influenza virus can cause disease that affects multiple internal organs with mortality of up to 90% to 100 in chickens, often within 48 hours. God. However, ducks can be infected without any signs of illness, and then they just drop dead? Or, can, or are they carriers? You don't hear about a bunch of ducks dying. Maybe they're carriers. It's very rare for a human to be infected. For a human to be infected. So there you go. Don't don't spread misinformation. Okay. The first U.S. case of a person infected with avian influenza A H five N one virus was reported in April in Colorado. The patient recovered after experiencing a few days of fatigue. Whoa. So someone had bird flu in April in Colorado. The virus does not pose a special risk in the nation's food supply given proper handling. Heating food to an internal temperature of 165. Well, I guess we're all going to eat dry fucking chicken breast for the next year. The bird populations haven't seen viruses like this before. So in terms of their immune response, they're all immunologically naive to this. Right now, it's like a kid in a candy store racing around infecting birds' populations. U.S. experts had been bracing for an outbreak, watching successful strains of the bird flu proliferate in Europe and elsewhere. And now that the virus is here, it shows no sign of going away. A key part of the challenge, Webby says, is that like the SARS COVID 2 virus, the avian flu virus has spun off several variants of concern and right now a specific of the virus known as clade 2.344b why do they name these fucking things 
you can't think of <laughs> that like an Omicron variant because of its wide prevalence. Viruses are notoriously quick to mutate, and since its arrival in North Carolina, the bird flu has continued to change. When the virus came over into the Americas, it started to interact with the viruses that we have in our wild birds here, picking up different combinations of other genes. Comparing the U.S. virus to the one in Europe. From the outside looking in, they look very similar. But when you actually go on the inside and take a look, the viruses we have here are quite different now from what it what was in Europe. It's possible that wild bird populations will build up an immunity to the virus, but Webby warns that it will take months to understand whether that is happening at a meaningful level. The outbreak hasn't raised all poultry costs. If you like eat to eat chicken, you're in luck. This version of influenza virus doesn't affect broilers. Chicken raised for meat as badly as it does layers, table egg laying hens and turkeys. Turkey eggs? They must sell that shit to egg product companies. Turkey eggs. Um, for whatever reason, turkeys and layer birds tend to be more susceptible to the virus, says Amy Hagerman an assistant professor at Oklahoma State University who specializes in agriculture, agricultural economics. So let me know if you'd like to hear Susio read to you. Uh, it's a service that I can provide. A chicken that most people think of, their chicken tenders, their chicken sandwiches, all those things haven't tended to the same kinds of impact. I have, you know... I think that there's a lot of uh, fried chicken restaurants out here in the world that uh, now you see more of them, right? Ever since the whole Popeye's, Chick-fil-A, fucking Burger King has always kind of had one. Uh, McDonald's always kind of had one. Uh, crispy chicken sandwich. Um, you know, Dave's Hot Chicken is expanding. They're opening all different kinds of locations everywhere. So... I just wonder what happens when, uh, you know, say five fried chicken restaurants all using thighs open up in a busy city. What does that look like on the, the farm's end? Uh, can they account for this uptick in, uh, in need? Are they ready for that? Are we going to lose are we going to be able to supply all the new restaurants that open? So I mean, with all this shit that's happening, like people want to, you want to open restaurants, you look, live your life, l do what you want to do, right? Live your dream. But now, unfortunately, we're in a place where we have to think about our carbon footprint and what the fuck that means. Okay. So, you know, it, it's terrible that that that's what's happening, but that's that's what's happening. So, um, hopefully, the chicken restaurants are not affected because I enjoy me a fried chicken sandwich. Um, Six twenty nine for a fucking twelve eggs out here. Hagerman warns that in time of inflationary pressure and supply chain snags, it can be hard to directly link a price hike to the virus. But she notes that U.S. egg prices can be affected if just a few farms have to dispose of their flock. We are really at, like, life is fragile, guys. We live our life and we walk around like everything's fine. And then some shit hits us, our health. And we fucking, we got to run, bro. Generally speaking, these complexes are over a million birds e easily. It takes uh, fewer egg-laying operations being affected by HPAI to drive up the price of eggs and egg products, she adds. Especially since the majority of U.S. production goes to the domestic market. Uh, the virus has hit many turkey farms, but because those operations tend to be smaller and the cases have been spread out over time and space, producers have mostly been able to absorb the losses building up stocks of frozen turkey ahead of the end of the year holidays so yes we certainly saw an increase in turkey prices in this holiday season Hagelman says but not as much as we might have anticipated given the extent of the outbreak 
So the commercial food chain under fucking attack. No eggs. Shit's expensive. Um, so what do we do? Not buy eggs. Is there an alternate to fucking eggs for breakfast? I mean, I guess you could just eat sausage. It is just protein and fat at the end of the day, no? Uh, a lot of countries don't use vaccines for this virus in their poultry. One of the big complications is timing on a vaccine. Definitely right. Generally, you need two doses of vaccine and the length of time to achievement full effectiveness. If you have a bird that has a very short feeding window before it's ready for harvest, that can be a lot more challenging because you also need to allow the withdrawal period after the vaccine before the bird is harvested. Damn. The difficulty of surveillance, knowing whether a bird is infected with a de deadly influenza virus but isn't showing symptoms because they've been vaccinated. Damn. So, huge outbreak. Went to Whole Foods today. No fucking eggs. Uh, what are you going to do? You know? And then last week, we... Uh, chef thoughts and pictures. A virus took them out. Sounds like a virus that took out a bunch of people recently. Yeah, could be. Uh, I left off last week on Best Chef Mid-Atlantic. Uh, so we were going through the... Uh, The James Beard Foundation, uh, Best Chef Mid Atlantic, Nathan Kreiler, what's up? It's the mass production and processing of our food that has created the problem. You're damn right, man. At the end of the day, it's it's the 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 chase for money. And something I've realized is like anybody can open a restaurant. You know, you get your LLC and and uh, you have enough money to have a space. You don't have to really know how to fucking run a restaurant for them to allow you to just do it, right? And then you're gonna fail. But no matter what, the banks win. The banks win whether you win or lose. And that is the fucking problem. You can't have people profiting off of loss. Uh, it's becoming a big trend. Chris Amendola foraged in Baltimore, Maryland. Steve Chu, Ekiben in Baltimore, Maryland. This is Best Chef Mid-Atlantic. Uh, Joy Crump. Food, F-O-O-D-E, Fredericksburg, Virginia. David Deshays, Lear Dent, Washington, D.C. Nick Forsberg, Bet Risk, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Ramen Rock Harper, uh, Queen Mother's Fried Chicken, Arlington, Virginia. Andrew Henshaw, Laser Wolf, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Jesse Ito, Royal Sushi. Uh, Dionisio Jimenez, I think I read this list last time. Yeah, Michael Rafiti, I shouted him out at Albi. Uh, I think I might have left off at Best Chef Midwest. Uh, this is, a, again, the James Beard 2023 semifinalist. Sana Aburesk, Sana's Gourmet Mediterranean in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Ann Ahmed, Kaluna, Minneapolis. Nick Wagner, Indo, St. Louis, Missouri. Shout out to um, Nab Chef on Instagram. Uh, Samuel Charles, Rodina, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Rob Connolly, Bull Rush, St. Louis, Missouri. Michael Corvino, Corvino Supper Club and Tasting Room, Kansas City, Missouri. Um, now I remember that I also did that one. I thought I, I thought I wrote down the right one, but I didn't. Um, I'm gonna start in New York State if that's okay. All right, a lot of Midwest fucking restaurants out here. Uh, best Chef New York State: Gerardo Alcaraz, Aldama, Brooklyn, New York; Nasim Alikani, Sofre in Brooklyn, New York; Mary Atia, The Musket Room, New York; Giovanni Cervantes, Taqueria Ramirez, New York. Keep saying New York. We're on the fucking New York list. Amanda Cohen, Dirt Candy. Calvin Eng, Bonnie's in Brooklyn. Shanari Freeman, Cadence in New York. Charles Gabriel, Charles Pan Fried Chicken, The City. Anthony Gon Goncalves, Gonsalves, Canopy, White Plains. Sohan Little Mad, City. JJ Johnson, Field Trip, City. Sohu Kim, 
uh, Gage and Tolner, City, Shana Low Banyan, Cafe Mutton, Hudson, Paola Garcia Mendoza, uh, Karen Deria, Karen Deria, Nayak, Aisha Nur Nurjaja, Shuket, 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 in New York, the city, uh, Jonghyun Park, Atomics, is that how you say that? Yeah, I think so. Uh, he came and did 12 days, and it's fucking super hard to get a reservation at that restaurant, man. It's the it's really tough. Um, Franco Sampogna, Frevo, New York. Eric C., Ursula, Brooklyn. Hillary Sterling, C. Siamo. Uh, Sohel Zandi, Brushland Eating House, Bovina. Best Chef Northeast. What up, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Vermont. Robert Andriozzi, Pizza Marvin, Providence, Rhode Island. Paul Canna Callahan, Vino Abino, Exeter. Jeff Forner. Jeff fucking Forner over here. Thompson House Eatery, Jackson, New Hampshire. Um, fucking Mojo Hansi Davis, Mayday, Burlington, Vermont. These are the uh, Northeast James Beard Foundation 2023 nominees uh, this is not the finalized list they'll do that in a few weeks valentine howell crassy boston mass christian hunter community table washington connecticut sarah jenkins nina june rockport maine jasa jason laverdier flux in lisbon falls maine courtney loreg woodford food and beverage portland maine alganesh michael a taste of abyssinia south Burlington, Vermont, Jahia Noor, Tawakal Halal Cafe, Boston, Massachusetts, Tony Pastor, 4th Street, Portland, Maine, Isao Perez, Isa, Portland, Maine, Sherry Pocknett, Sly Fox Den 2, Charleston, Rhode Island, shout out to Rhode Island, uh, Yisha Siu, Yunnan Kitchen, Boston, Mass, Derek Teh, Sekali, Boston, Eli, Tiglao, Tanam, Somerville, Mass., Shout out to Somerville, Mass. They, they got some good restaurants out there. Rene Tuponce. Uh, the Port of Call, Mystic, Connecticut. Oh, Mystic Pizza, Julia Roberts, Mystic, Connecticut. Melena Pagan, Little Sister, Providence, Rhode Island. And Douglas Williams, Mida in Boston. And then this is Best Chef Northwest and Pacific. Nathan Bentley. Altura Bistro in Anchorage, Tony Brown Ruins in Spokane, Washington, Peter Cho, Han Oak in Portland. Heard a lot about that restaurant. Joshua Dorsak, Moss, Ashland, Oregon, Brian Hirata, Na'au, Hawaii Islands, Jonathan Jones, Epilogue Kitchen and Cocktails in Salem, Oregon, uh, Dom Kumu, Crafted, Yakima, Washington, Kriakali, Kiki, Kikali, Kikali. Kapahail, Honolulu, Melissa Miranda, Musang, Seattle, Vince Nguyen, Berlue, Portland, David Nichols, 8 Row, Thomas Pisha, Duffy, Gato Gato, Portland, Crystal Platt, Lion and Owl, Eugene, Oregon, Bo Schooler, and Boca Alupo, uh, Geno, Geno, Alaska, Sheldon Simeon, Tiffany's Wailuku, Mutsuku Soma, Kamonegi, Seattle, uh, Renee Trafton, Peak Restaurant, Robert Urquidi, Ethel's Grill, Honolulu, Aaron Versosa, Archipelago, Lee Ann Wong, Papaina, Lahaina, Hawaii. Best Chef Southeast. I got a lot of fucking work to do out here in James Beard. Sam Forre, Tuk Tuk Sri Lankan Bites, Lexington, Kentucky. Josh Habiger, a bastion in Nashville, Tennessee. Heard a lot of, a lot of good things about that restaurant. Sam Hart Counter uh, in Charlotte. Ronald Sue and Aaron Phillips, Lazy Betty in Atlanta, Georgia. Daniel Dano, Hines, Vernes, Charleston, South Carolina. Terry Koval, The Deer and the Dove in Decatur, Georgia. Dana Lee Marquez, Comal 864, Greenville, South Carolina. Ji Yeon Lee and Cody Taylor, Heirloom Market Barbecue, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Josiah Magohe, Magohe, 
Vivian, Asheville, North Carolina. Hey. Uh, Ramen Mirsakani, Laurie's Restaurant, Charleston. Trevor Moran, Locust. That fucking restaurant is bomb, dog. I say that is a chef's restaurant. That is a chef's chef restaurant, meaning that chefs like to go eat there. Uh, went out there with Trevor Perkins during my road trip. Shout out to him. And ate it. Uh, Trevor Moran. Uh, cool ass fucking dude. I was going to the obituary show that night and he played obituary the entire fucking night. That is hardcore death metal. And, you know, I grew up in restaurants where you don't listen to that shit and no one could fucking tell it was even on. I mean, the energy was just so strong with the food and everything else that it didn't matter what food, what music you played. Um, and I, I love that and I want to have that for sure. Um, Let's see. Dean Neff, Seabird, Wilmington, North Carolina. Keith Rhodes, Catch, Wilmington, North Carolina. Isaiah Screech, Spark Community Cafe, Versailles, Kentucky. Versailles, Kentucky. Jessica Shiyato, Spotted Salamander in Columbia, South Carolina. Sahar Siddiqui, uh, Chaipani, Decatur, Georgia. Um, let's see. Remember, 510-463-1145. Call in, call in live. Get on the show. Be on the show. Be on the show. Uh, Paul Smith, 1010 Bridge, Charlton. Charleston, uh, West Virginia. Stephanie Tyson, Sweet Potatoes, Winston-Salem. Deborah Van Trace, uh, Twisted Soul Cookhouse and Pours, Atlanta. Pretty Was, Chini Indian Food Emporium, Raleigh. Best Chef South. Uh, look at my boys out here, top of the list. Blake Al Aguilard and Trey Smith of St. Germain. Um, that's where the picture of Austin Leslie's hanging up. Shout out to Nick Gambino. Timon Balu, the Catherine, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Jeremy and Cindy Behrman, Oceano Kitchen, Florida. Anna Castro, Lengua Madre, New Orleans. I didn't get to eat there, but shout out to her. She's doing great things. Fernando Nando and Valerie Chang, Itame in Miami. Hunter Evans, Elvis, Jackson, Mississippi. Francis Guzman, Vianda, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Shout out to Francis Guzman. Um, I had to go out there and interview him. Amaris and Jordan Her Herndon. Herndon. Uh, Palm and Pine, New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, Timothy Honsas, Johnny's Restaurant. Um, shout out to Michelle the Fox who told me she was going to call in but never does uh, 510-463-1145 hit it up alright uh, let's see what are we doing here uh, going through the, the Francis Guzman Vianda San Juan Puerto Rico Amaris Jordan Herndon Palm and Pine New Orleans uh, Alex Perry and Kumio Mori, Vestige, Ocean Springs, Mississippi. Rick Mays, Tropical Smokehouse in West Palm Beach, Florida. Melissa M. Martin, Mosquito Supper Club. Heard a lot about that in New Orleans. Pushkar Marath, Stage, Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Henry Mosso, Kabuki Sushi, Orlando, Florida. Charlie Pierre, Fritai. I ate there with uh, Ben Bloom. And his new wife, they got married this past year. Congratulations to Ben Bloom. Uh, he did time with me at Toulouse's on Thames as well as worked at uh, Linea and uh, uh, Comey in Oakland. Charlie Pierre, man, it was delicious, bro. He had a whole fried fish and shit. I mean, it was fucking bomb. Colleen Quarles and Liz Hollinger, Molly's Rise and Shine, New Orleans, L.A. Rafael Rio. Um... Yellos del Alma de Mexico, Bentonville, Arizona. Uh, Michael Stoltzfus, Coquette, New Orleans. Heard a lot about that, too. Uh, look at this. Look at this. Natalia Vallejo, Cocina al Fondo, San Juan, Puerto Rico. I've heard of that restaurant as well. Uh, Loho, Washington, Queen of Sheba, West Palm Beach, Florida. Best Chef Southwest. God damn, they really fucking break this shit up over here. Ben Alexander, Mr. Kim's Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oscar Amador, Anima by Ido. Las Vegas, Nevada. 
uh, Rene Andretti and Roberto Centeno. Uh, Bocanora, Phoenix, Arizona. Kau, Kauru Azeuchi, Kaiseki Yuzu, Las Vegas. Jaron Bates and Brett Bibber, The Table at Junipine. Lisa Becklin, Farm Bar. Andrew Black, Gray Sweater, Oklahoma City. Jeff Chancalun, Mar Mother Lao Kitchen, Oklahoma City. Jiv Chung, Red Plate, Las Vegas. Nephi Craig, Cafe Goju, White River, Arizona. Okay, let me go back to that one real quick. I'm just going to lame the last one here. Wendy Garcia, Tumedico, Tucson, Arizona. Yo. Nephi Craig is my boy. All right. He, I met him a long time ago when he stars at the restaurant at Meadowood, coming from his reservation in White River, Arizona. Um, I always said, hey, man, I'm going to come see you one day. I'm going to come. I'm going to go over there. Um, and Nephi Craig is the man. And such a fucking calm individual that came from a very uh, rough upbringing, you know. And he showed me around the reservation and he invited me into his restaurant and he actually he taught a class to recovering alcohol, alcoholic men from the reservation. Um, and he was doing this out of a restaurant. The restaurant is in a gas station and he's got a beautiful hearth in there, beautiful kitchen. So, um, it might be some damn, uh, guest chef dinners up there in the future, raise some money for that, uh, that reservation and, and Nephi Craig's efforts to help, uh, people that, um, from his community that are overcoming addictions while showing them the roots of, uh, the cooking for their tribe and, you know, a lot of this stuff has been forgotten through, you, we all know the fucking history. We don't got to go there. But Nephi Craig, uh, he's also in a series on Netflix. Uh, and I'm not sure the name of it, but I'll look it up right now. Nephi Craig. Nephi Craig. He's popping off over here. Yeah, going green. Look, he's got NPR articles. He's out here decolonizing recovery through native food ways. That's basically the best way I could say that. Decolonizing recovery through native food ways. He's really teaching uh, people over there how to cook with the native uh, food that comes from the land, whether it's acorn, corn, whatever it is. Um, and I got to experience him teaching that class firsthand. And just a, a upstanding human being. Um, I hope him, you know, nothing but the best and the most success for him and his family. He invited me. Gather Film on Netflix. That's what it's called. Gather Film. Check it out. But he's a super cool dude, man. And, you know, the way he invited me into his house and just the way he communicated with his son. I remember how impactful it was. You know, you, you, as, you wanted to do stuff for him. You know, he asked his son to get gas and he's like, hey, son, will you please go get gas at the gas station? And just that, like being referred to as son, like not by your name or not like, hey, you motherfucker, uh, was very powerful. And um, I was happy that I got to witness that intimate part of that man's life. Uh, but that's all the James Beard motherfuckers that I just put on here. Uh, we are. Still waiting for Sh Michelle the Fox calling. All right. She's getting called out super hard. That's at Michelle the Fox. You can uh, hit her up on DM and tell her why the fuck didn't you call Susio Talk? You know what I mean? Um, you know, I, I got no complaints over here. I'm uh, about to do a trial soon for a chef job. Uh, you know, I think I got another good five to 10 years in me for, for the whole chef thing going in it hard, you know, but I also don't want to let go of this podcast and I'm going to focus on both things. You know, back in the day when you're at these three star restaurants, they need your full attention. And sometimes if you 
start doing other things, it can be brought into question if you make mistakes in that kitchen. Um, and unfortunately, that's just the way it is, right? So it's hard to navigate you doing other things uh, because sometimes it doesn't sit uh, that well with with chefs, you know? Um, so I'm going to continue focusing on both and I'm going to live life like the fucking adventure that I want to live. Just remember, you don't have to do what your parents tell you to do, okay? Other than like brush your fucking teeth, wipe your ass, don't be dirty, don't kill anybody, you know? Um, but honestly, you know, the, the new generation has turned school on its head. We don't know whether to go to school, who to listen to, what news outlets we should listen to. It's all a bunch of fear-mongering propaganda out here. Uh, but, you know, over here at Sucio Talk, we're going to stay positive. Uh, I'm not in the studio right now, but soon enough I will be. I'll have some more guests for you guys as I uh, get a little bit more of a schedule together and see what the fuck is going on in my life. Um, but can't complain. I'm happy that I'm able to do this show for you guys weekly for live Mondays. All right. You can call in 510-463-1145. 510-463-1145. Be on a podcast. Shout out your mom. Shout out a restaurant. Talk about an issue. You know, whatever you want. You just want to bullshit. Uh, this is after service. This is for all the cooks, chefs, bartenders, barbacks, GMs, fucking whoever you are out there in the industry, out of the industry, fucking tune in to motherfucking Sucio Tarka. You will not be disappointed. You know what I mean? Um, it's only the beginning. You know, we're only in the about to be the third year here once we hit November. So third year of the podcast in November. The first year was all audio because um, I thought it was awkward to try to interview chefs. And chefs are awkward people, right? So by nature, they're going to be fucking weird. So I try not to put a camera in anyone's face t to not make it weird. And then as I saw, you know, where the world is going, I said, we need to move to video. So I moved to video. I got a studio. And that was a big learning process there. And I'm glad I did it because now I know a lot of shit. Oh, crazy fucking thing that happened to me the other day. I'm in the Best Buy parking lot because I'm going in to, to Best Buy to, um, to get some equipment that I needed for, for this setup. I was missing a wire. So I'm going in there and I see this woman filming herself in her, the trunk of her car. Like she's sitting in her trunk and she has her camera on the seat and she's filming out towards the parking lot talking and blogging and I like start talking to her say what's up she says what's up to me I was like are you blogging she's like yeah and I'm like are you on YouTube she's like yeah I'm on YouTube and I'm in the blog I'm like hey what the fuck um goon status is right uh so this guy Zach from Oakland man you're distracting my fucking story dog that's all good. Uh, so we're, I go to Best Buy, right? I'm in Best Buy. And then, uh, or I'm on my way into Best Buy. And this woman's blogging, and I see her with her camera. And I, I basically just want to ask her what kind of microphone she has on her camera. I think I already know what she's going to say. It's the Rode uh, Procaster mic. Okay. So I'm talking to her a little bit. All of a sudden, her husband shows up. And I recognize him. And so... When I was starting to learn about video podcasting, I went onto YouTube and I, you know, searched up a uh, video podcast uh, and, you know, what kind of cameras I need, what kind of equipment do I need for sound, how do I uh, make the best uh, fucking camera views and shit like that. How do I do it? I'm not sure. So I go to fucking YouTube and I look at these people and his name is Tom Buck. The Sony a7 IV is an awesome camera. Oh, sure. And I think yeah, that's a pretty objective right just there. fact at this. Okay. So anyway, Tom Buck on YouTube. Look at it. 
So I see, I meet this guy, right? Crazy shit. Could it, couldn't have happened any more perfect. And then I realize it's him. And I literally am telling him like, yo, you taught me everything I know. Everything I know about using cameras, sound, the equipment that I needed. Basically, single-handedly fucking taught me how to do video podcast. And, I mean, dude, so grateful to meet these people. And you never know where you're going to meet people. And that's a cool thing about uh, social media and YouTube and all that. You meet all these people out and about. And I'm telling you, I was just pulled into a random Best Buy. I wasn't even planning on going to Best Buy that day. I just saw it. You know, and I was like, oh, I need this wire. Fucking go over there. And I see Tom Buck. It's at Tom Buck on on uh, on Instagram. If you want to learn how to start a podcast, I suggest you go to this fucking this person, Tom Buck, and he can hook you up. I met him and his girlfriend, super sweet people. They live down here in uh, Palm Springs area, California. Shout out to them and their YouTube success. 116,000 subscribers. So uh, it's their full time job, and uh, you know I would love to. Uh, just do the podcast and you know I want this podcast to be much more than just a fucking podcast like I'm gonna be getting out there and you know I want to do live shows I've been talking about that I want to get that set up I need to find somebody to do short form content I need to find a couple maybe three people to do that because I want full-on content all the fucking time on all the channels Um, and I want to do little shorts where I go to um, restaurants and basically sit down with the chef, maybe have dinner and just put that all in a nice video and put that on Instagram as well. Maybe show it during the live, right? So we can all watch something together, laugh. Those of you that are on Instagram, I'm sorry, you won't be able to watch what we're watching. All right, you got to go over to YouTube. Uh, That is uh, Sucio Talk. Subscribe. Remember, when you guys go on YouTube from Instagram, it doesn't sign you in. Therefore, you cannot subscribe. Therefore, your boy Sucio loses. All right? And Sucio don't like losing. Okay? So, with all the love in the world, I think we leave this here. This is the fifth episode fifth episode of Sucio Talk Live. It's number 111. Sucio Talk Podcast number 111. All right. It's 111 episodes. We're about two years and some change years old. 103 subscribers on YouTube. I've had about 40,000 listeners from all over the world. Couldn't be more grateful. Um, As I do this week to week, it's going to get better. You know, I'm um, uh, this is sort of a practice in that to see. I'm thinking about opening up also maybe a Friday morning show. Do a Friday morning and a Monday night show. Just sort of recap. Um, but, you know, I have to find a, a way to document things during the week. Um, that way I can bring you guys uh, the news that you actually want to fucking hear. You know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, Sucio, chef at suciotalk.com. You can email me, email me stories, fucking shout outs, whatever you'd like. It have to do with hospitality or not. It's all good. We're here to talk about everything that's fun in the world. Uh, so if you find yourself out there with a little bit of extra time, write an email to chef at suciotalk.com. Check out suciotalk.com for merch. And uh, I'm grateful that some of you have been enjoying them, uh, namely uh, beans, spelled with a three, four. Uh, a lot of a good community here. And I think some of you are starting to talk outside of that realm. I know a few people have reached out to Charlie Apple through these efforts. And, uh, you know, he's, he's right there. He'd be willing to answer any question you guys have. And uh, he's a pretty cool dude. Uh, obviously, don't fucking bombard his Instagram or do, you know, I make him feel good. Uh, but hit it up guys. Help me out. Subscribe fucking Instagram. Uh, I'll try to be a little bit better about putting, uh, the scheduling, the shows, 
That way you guys can hit that notification button and, and do all that shit. I'm trying not to become a YouTuber. All right. It's like, I don't want to be like, hey, guys, click the fucking link in the bio or whatever the fuck. It's like, I want this show to just be stand up on its own. Where motherfuckers just come here to get a dose of sucio for the evening. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Scout Out West up there in Seattle. Holding down the fort in the north while I hold down the fort in the south. You know what I'm talking about. Big Mitch out here. Pimping hoes. Slapping. <laughs> uh, slapping motherfuckers in their face. You know what I mean? Uh, but anyway, this has been Sucio Talk live every Monday at 10 p.m. Check me out. Scout out West. Call in next week. We want to hear some, some stories. All right? Some old school stories from you. All right? Everybody peace out. Um, and have a good week. Again, 510-463-1145. You can call, leave a message. I'll play it on the show. You can text. I'll read it on the show, show it on the show. It's a hotline, okay? You guys can call. It's the it's a, it's a red phone, okay? And it's always available. I will never pick it up unless it's Monday at 10, all right? But other than that, you can call, leave a message, do whatever you got to do. Peace. Belly Melly, say what's up to Tom. He needs to be on the fucking podcast already. It's ending, all right? Every, every Monday at 10. If you don't join me, you're going to be square with the rest of them. You tell them I said that to you. Shout out. Peace. Peace.